So hello again to all who joined our event. My name is Christina Penetzdorfer. I am the chief curator at uh, the Museum der Moderne Salzburg in Austria. And I would like to welcome you to the lecture by Xu Chin Tsui, which is taking place today as part of our exhibition, Stepping Out, Female Identities in Chinese Contemporary Art. The exhibition has been a large scale collaboration between our museum, um, the Lillehammer Art Museum in Norway and Gea Strand Copenhagen in Denmark. It uh, presents to an European audience the richness of artistic practices of women from mainland China through 26 female artists from three generations with the aim of decisively expanding the narrative of contemporary art from China, which has been predominantly male dominated for about 30 years. The following can be identified as the core questions of our exhibition and of our, of our project. So for example, what does an individual woman's and female artist's journey through life look like in light of China's social and political transformation? Or how can sometimes painful childhood memories and the wounds born by mothers and grandmothers become sources of strength? How do lives unfold between individualism and conformity and which role does solidarity play in them? Or what does it mean for a woman and especially a woman artist to break free from constraining social demands? And finally, how can women tell stories of women in new ways? Many of the works in our exhibition have an intimate and personal character especially those of the youngest artists. Accordingly, some of the works can be described as radical and oppositional. They address or even depict themes such as self-injury, rage and impudent sense, female sexuality, motherhood, sexual orientation, and resistance to authority. These works, some of which are highly emotional, most directly reflect the reality of life for women and especially women artists in China. This huge exhibition and publication project could not have been realized without a great project team. Niels Olsen, the initiator of the exhibition, and I had the support of two Chinese co-curators, that is, Feng Bui, a freelance curator and art critic based in Beijing, and Liu Shi, an artist from Shanghai. There were often the door openers and the communicators to the Chinese woman artists. But fundamental to the success of the exhibition and publication, however, was also our advisory board of four female experts who formed the scientific basis of this project. So I'm very pleased to welcome Xu Ching Tsui as a member of this advisory board with us today. Xu Jin is professor for Asian studies and cinema studies at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine in the United States. Her research interests span interdisciplinary fields, fields such as film studies, cultural studies and visual art studies with a focus on gender politics. She is the author of numerous texts on feminist issues, including, for example, the title Women Through the Lens, Gender and Nation in a Century of Chinese Cinema, or Gender Bodies Toward a Woman's Visual Art in Contemporary China, and a special issue of um, positions. And that one was very important to me personally to get things sorted out, um, that was the special issue engendering Chinese women's art in the making. And uh, Xu Jin was also the initiator and co-curator of the exhibition Breakthrough Work by Contemporary Chinese Women Artists, which was shown at Baudin College Museum of Art in 2013. 
So we are very grateful to her and are pleased to have Xu Jin join us today to give an introduction on China's visual culture from a female perspective using examples of women artists and works from the exhibition Stepping Out. Enjoy. Thank you, Christina, for the uh, introduction and thank you for the opportunity to meet audience in Europe online. Wish I could be in Europe in person because that's the place in the continent I have never, never been to. That's my dream. Someday I'd love to, to travel to Europe here. And to follow up Christina's question, and I raise a lot of questions here too. You can see my title, why women's art, you know, as a subject of study, as a topic of a discussion. And I'm going to cite quite a number of work, uh, out of work pieces from exhibition to share the stories, my research and my writing about this topic. So my topic is a question why we are talking about women's arts. I have a, word, a few, a couple of principal questions to raise before I go to the examples and artworks. So first one, questions in consideration. How are we to view work by women artists in terms of gender politics, as well as aesthetic articulations? Why have Chinese women artists refused to have their work identified in terms of a feminism, even if they engage in feminist art practices? Or simply, what is women's art and why take it as a subject for discussion? Because when I say women's art, I can have criticism immediately. So you have to explain why label as women's art. I'm going to deliver a pretty concise uh, presentation, which will entail, contain four parts. Part number one is gendering history. So in response to those questions, I'd like to examine women's visual art in contemporary China with the female body as a subject for exploration and the medium of aesthetic experiments. Bodily inscription through visual articulation, I argue, involve a process of gendering, which in challenges artistic conventions, as well as viewers' preconceptions. So I'm going to use gender as a verb, part one, gendering history. The insertion of a female experience and the personal history into Chinese art history rewrites a historiography that has denied legitimacy to the woman's artist. Women's engagement in historical rewriting challenges historiography beyond a mainstream narrative of the traditional, the national, and the political. Now, the artworks we are viewing here on my uh, file here by Tao Aimi, Tao Aimi, two pieces here. The first one is The River of a Woman. The second one is a woman's book. That is the display and exhibition from exhibition uh, stepping out. And you went to the exhibition, you must be very, very familiar with those two works here. Time, timing, washboard series. So those two are washboard series undertake an ethnographical exploration of the ordinary women who spend their lives confined within domestic domains performing household chores. Their names unknown, stories untold, using the washboard as an art medium and the taking narratives of the ordinary as history, timing's work addresses important issues, how to integrate the ordinary into both social and art history and where to locate narratives in historiography. So in the first artwork, The River of Woman, Taimi ensembled 56 washboards into the form of a flowing river, accompanied by the sounds of a modern washing machine. Each washboard 
presents or represents an unknown woman whose experience has been concealed inside the domestic sphere. To unveil the anonymous woman, the artist inscribed the image of each onto her board, acknowledging her identity. After 56 pieces gather into a collective identity, the river, the installation creates an archive of silent histories. The artist, now let, let's look at the second one. The artist further considers the entry of a female experience into recorded history through the artifact of the book. The artist found new Shu or women's writing from a local place in Hunan to be unique mode of expression. Nu Shu created by women and dating back to the Shang Dynasty is composed in phonetic syllabary and the formulaic verse comprehensible only to women themselves. With the ancient bamboo script binding formats, the woman's book includes pages made ink rubbings from the washboards. Those rubbings appear as the primary content of the book and the new shu calligraphy as commentary. The whole piece creates a visual as well as a written text. By combining installation arts and the woman's writing in Nishu verse, timing creates profoundly female expression, as well as woman's history in their own writing and authorship. Let's move to Peng Wei. Peng Wei, the artist in the sculpture of an autumn of a Tang Dynasty, conjures classical Chinese ink painting with different types of materials and the media. She wraps the torsos of a commercial female mannequins with a hemp or rice paper, and then inscribes classical ink painting across the surface of the body. The innovation transforms two-dimensional painting into three-dimensional sculpture, where the female form assumes material as well as gendered significance. Her formal explorations extend the conversation between the classical and the contemporary, between the female body and the historical settings. I love this uh, artwork and it's the book, book cover of my book. Another case study or example from our exhibition is Wen Hui's listening to third grandma's stories. The work uh, intends to uncover the account of a woman's life experience into documentary film. The film subject was her third grandma, whom she had never met nor heard about. The documentary not only reveals through daily interviews who the third grandma was, but also most importantly, provides a woman's oral history counter to the official narrative. The grandmother's personal memories of a female experience set against China's social political history. The stories include the brutal victimization of landlord families during the land reform campaign. Not only does her narrative run counter to the official vision of that history, but it's also gender specific. Viewers learn that the grandmother married as a child bride at the age of 11 through arranged marriage between two landlord families. Too young to know what it means to be a wife and a mother, she had her first child without any knowledge of a maternal experience and the baby died. The marriage eventually ended in divorce because of her unfaithful husband. 
So a female oral history comes to terms as the grandmother serves as the film subject as well as the first person narrator, while the artist becomes the listener to the story and the woman behind the camera. The film title, Listening, addresses not only storytelling, but also story reception. As the oral history carries personal memory from narrator to audience, it creates a bond between the film subject and the filmmaker. In the daily life scenes, for instance, both women are combing their hairs. An intimate relationship and the familial association are formed as the two women bind themselves with their hair woven together. The hair colors, one silver, another black, signify a familial and emotional connection, not only between the grandma and the artist, but also between the oral history and the documentary filmmaking. Let's move on, still under the title of uh, historiography. And we have uh, two pieces here, Xing Danwen, born with the Cultural Revolution, and Yu Hong, 1966 months old, Xi'an. Xing Danwen, born with the uh, revolution, the Cultural Revolution, grants the pregnant body a uh, subject position and locates closely to the issue of history. So you can raise the question, what is that connection between the pregnant body and its history? For the generation born in the 1960s and 1970s, historical memory largely resides in photographic images and the other visual means. Specifically, in the eyes of the generation, the political past is less a matter of social reality or personal trauma due to their young age at the time, rather than of the iconography of political images, such as mouse portrait in the background, you will see the little red book badges and the military uniforms. To review that history from a gendered and generational perspective, the photographer plants historical images in the private space, you know, in her bedroom, and shared with the pregnant body pre previously absent from social, political, and the photographic histories. By then, what was impossible, the juxtaposed images produce a visual and a discursive tension with the political icons as a background reference and the pregnant body as the central subject. The presence of the pregnant body challenges the visual conventions that once accorded primacy to the larger than life figure of the political leader, a collective body of the working class and the government controlled socialist landscape. Now let's see Yu Hong's work. Yu Hong witnessed to growth by locating herself side by side with official media images. The autobiographical unfolding generates an intertextual frame wherein the personal and the female becomes embodiment of a political history. Yu Hong's work, this piece, has been ongoing project since 1999. Each year, the artist creates oil painting, a self-portrait based on a, photo a photograph chosen from her personal albums. Dating from the age of six months, this is the one, six months old to the present. Each portrait is then placed side by side with the image of a political event or historical moments selected from mass media, posters, or newspapers. By means of a collage, the self-portraits generate an autobiographical account juxtaposed with social political history. In 1966, you know why she chose this year? When Mao launched the Cultural Revolution and reviewed masses in Tiananmen Square, Yu Hong was six months 
old, sleeping soundly inside her baby carrier. The official pictorial images remind us of the historical moment of the 1960s, totally different here, when the Cultural Revolution ruled the political landscape throughout China. So the oil painting of the baby girl indicates the generation born into a turbulent political environment few could escape. So the visual continuity of the political and the personal through photography and oil painting reinforces the recognition of a woman's living history. The persistent installation of her self-image once each year reinforces the artist's subject position and a self identity. So I am the history, I'm part of a social political history. Now let's move to part two. And the title is Gendering Sexuality. It's fun to talk about this. And so female sexuality investigates how women artists have constructed a sexual counter discourse that challenges conventions imposed on female sexuality by socialist or by commercial in, uh, uh, imperatives. The gendering of sexuality reveals how the female body incites sexual pleasure in women while reversing the dynamics of the look from a woman as desired object to desiring subject. For instance, Huming's army series. I only select the one, she has a whole a big series. The sexual female body emerges from the concealment of military uniform and throws off the disguise of socialist gender hierarchies. The exposed female body sexually attractive, emotionally sensual, radically subverts the iconography of socialist arts and the CR, cultural revolution, post-culture. Who means, I mean, uh, series subvert the socialist body dress code and uncover the sexual body through translucent uniforms with breasts, and buttocks as a focal point, the picture uses translucency and the transparency to reclaim the body and the sexuality as a female, as a subject. Translucency suggests the possibility of seeing the underlying image clearly. At the same time, the female body in uniform carries a socialist gender code. Clothing meant to cover, to shape, and to make sexual bodies into a collective gender neutral identity or entity to join the collective in a male defined space and the military apparatus or woman needs to dress, to act, to fight as a man. But the possibility of discerning the female body through a translucent uniform, however, makes visible the female sexuality driven from view in the daily life and artistic practices of Mao's China. And I'll cite another example to support the idea of a female sexuality by Cui Xiuwen's Ladies Room. This is a video work. The subject of female sexuality is further explored through the dialectical relationship between gender and the space. Cui Xiuwen's hidden camera in her ladies' room shows sex workers inside the ladies' room of an affluent nightclub in Beijing. The video expo exposure reveals how prostitution once eliminated is re-emerging in public space. In fact, the video forcefully demonstrates continuity from court censorship in imperial China to sexual culture in contemporary society. Courtesans and the modern prostitutes perform as the sexual other to entertain men and make them feel romantic, intellectual, and successful. Today's sex worker has learned, however, to invest her body as a sexual capital. She shares market values with her customers. 
in a state-managed market society where female sexuality faces either sections or commodification, it is difficult to speak about women's pleasure. The discussion of female sexuality in visual representation leads to an ongoing uncertainty. If we open ourselves to pleasure, do we also open ourselves to danger? Now I move to part three within the uh, time allowance here, gendering the pain. The body in pain speaks either for trauma, traumatic memory haunted by the a social political past or the psychological torment of social reality. And the citation and presentation here uh, by He Cheng Yao, two pieces here and shared in the exhibition too. Through He Cheng Yao's, uh, on my left here, titled 99 Needles, she remembered seeing when men from the People's Liberation Army came to her house, tied her mother to the doorboard and applied acupuncture needles in an attempt to cure her madness. The needle seemed to piece her mother's mind as well as her body, and her agonized voice became inscribed into daughter's memory. Yet, He Cheng Yao lacked a language able to articulate her pain. The memory of pain haunting He Cheng Yao's life finally manifested itself in her performance art. In the making of 99 Needles, she invited a Chinese physician to insert 99 acupuncture needles throughout her entire body. As the needles pierced her flesh and the pain caused her to faint, the artist entered a succession of trans transitions. She first transformed herself from a observing other into a suffering subject as a means to replace the maternal body with her own. She then took the pain that her mother had endured into her own experience. The problem of unspeakable, incomprehensible pain thus came to expression through performance reenactment or re-signification. One more example about uh, gendering pain. Xiao Lu, two works, 15 years apart. The first one, dialogue. Second one, 15 gunshots. When we talk about her work, we need to make a connection of those two pieces. It's kind of a dialogue between the two, again, 15 years apart. The first one, on February 5th, 1989, two hours after China Avant Guard exhibition opened at the National Art Museum in Beijing, the female artist Xiao Lu fired two bullets, bullets into her installation dialogue with a handgun, a real gun, and a real bullets. The incident began as a woman's installation and the performance of arts, but ended in political sanctions and conflicting readings interpretations. Media coverage, critics reviews, public responses, all viewed gunshot as a political challenge to official authority and Xiao Lu as avant-garde rebel against convention, conventional art traditions. Few who commented on the acts perceived installation and the performance as the personal expression of a troubled relationship and the unspeakable un experience of sexual insult. I figured that out after I finished the book and she um, exposed what's going on with, with, with that work actually. The artist's use of gunfire to express her personal frustration with the dialogue of a relationship and draw public attention to private anguish was hijacked by different discourses. The gunshots Xiao Lu meant as, as an utterance of a woman's voice and a spectacle of women's art 
instead became a skewed to section and the artist into silence. After 50 years of silence in 2003, the second piece, she presented to the public 15 gunshots from 1989 to 2003, that's the title. In contrast to dialogue, here Xiaolu used the photographic self images as targets and fired 15 shots, one at each image, representing 15 years of elapsed time. In 15 gunshots, the woman with the gun faced the front, clearly declaring the subject as well as the identity of the artist. You know, I am Xiaolu, I'm the artist. I was, you know, shots to my self images here. The 15 shots mark the end of a personal relationship and assertion of female identity and authorship. From two gun shots to release personal frustration to 15 shots to confront oneself and the public, the change represents the transition of gender trouble from passive silence to subjective utterance. Now my part number four, let's gendering material or gendering materiality. In the hands of installation artists, cotton threads or found garments become a material medium for expressing personal and social concerns. The first example here by Yin Xiu Zhen, title is uh, self-titled Yin Xiu Zhen, 1998. The artist searches for female identity through a personal subject deeply imprinted in her memory. She inserts all the photos of herself at, the, uh, at the different ages in the soles of a 10 pair of handmade cotton shoes. The shoes are identical in material and style, recalling a time during the Cultural Revolution when standard dress code unified a collective identity. We all wear that kind of shoes by then. In the self-titled piece that makes art out of a material culture, Yin Xiu Zheng claims her identity as a subject. Moreover, by personally sewing the shoes with her mother together, the artist not only evokes social and the familial past, but also effects material innovation in her creative practice. And the follow up in Xiu Zheng, is Lin Tianmiao, a well-known artist here. The artist searches for female identity too through a personal subject deep, no, that's in Xiu Zhen. So Lin Tianmiao, Lin Tianmiao uses cotton threads to both construct and to question identity too. In the piece from her focus series, the artist projected enlarged photographic portrait of herself on the canvas, which she wrapped with embroidered cotton bows, creating a visual interplay between individuality and material obscurity, between the artist as subject or an artifact as object, and between the photographic image and the three-dimensional surface. By transforming the image into mixed media prints overlaid with threads, and other materials, this portrait becomes a multi multifaceted med meditation on form and meeting. One more example by young artist Liu Xi. With ceramic and the glass as the primary materials, the emerging young artist Liu Xi is seeking fresh interactions between technology and aesthetics sculpture form and the materiality. In her hands, ceramic are shaped, reshaped into different kinds of winding curves and the flowing lines through meticulous traditional porcelain mechanics. The floral and the wall wall forms speak for the artist's view of female sexuality and the woman's voice. And then, 
I'm going to uh, close with something a little bit new, maybe different from the expression uh, by addressing beyond the female and the feminist with Jiang Jie's joint sculpture work titled Over 1.5 Tons. The whole piece is really physically weights over 1.5 tons. There's a lot of uh, steel, a lot of uh, metal, a lot of uh, hooks, everything used here. So I try to explain or support the idea that's beyond the female and the feminist. So women artists and their works have moved beyond search for just not this is not just for self identity, you know, to uh, pursue diverse subjects in a different media, progressing simultaneously in the Chinese as well as the global art landscape. What we have been witnessing here are uh, emerging artworks created either by you know, well-established artists like Jiang Jie or by talented new generation. Interestingly, feminist practices remain active, very active, even as the feminist label is rejected. So Jiang Jie's work, recent massive uh, sculpture installation, over one point tons, invites us as well, intimidates the desire for a feminist rating, a phallic shaped dying monster wrapped with colored lace and snagged by iron hooks appears in its impotent sexuality and a desperate masculinity. The female sculptor, through her selection of subject and material, creates a feminist art practice, both alluring and repulsive. In other words, the phallic imagery no longer signifies desire or symbolizes power, but rather points to an impotent, vulnerable, fragmented body. So the phallus in death throes. Its survival and uh, constancy depend on a special sculpture form and the material support, especially those iron hooks created as well manipulated by the female artist. So to make very quick conclusion and the summary, I hope my timing here is fine. It has taken a century for the Chinese woman to take a subject position and have her works receive attention. With this progress, women's art as a category of study is becoming more expensive and uh, variegated. The question is no longer why are there no great women artists? No, no more that question anymore as Linda Notley asked in the 1970s, but a rather relegation of a great woman artists from a, a public space and art canons. As the examples presented here shows, Chinese women artists have constantly negotiated their positions in art history and contributed to the art canons throughout the course of China's search for modernity. The dynamics of female and the feminist in gender construction and art canon, sorry. Can only partially explain the history of women and the art in China. The search for female identity and the feminist art practice <coughs> proceeds in relation to social political conditions of the nation states. The availability and the control of a public exhibition space and the shifting reception by viewers like you and the me and the critics. And I went <coughs> end up here and open up for questions. Thank you, Shuxin, for, for these great insights. Um, I think uh, right at the beginning, the second question quite hit my, my problems I had <laughs> at the beginning of the project. Um, why 
are uh, these works no works by feminist of feminist artists and why do they often refuse to be described as feminist artists that was quite difficult for me to understand from a western point of view and That's Yes, and your text helped me a lot. So, um, you you made a suggestion in one of your texts. You are um, um, you're making the suggestion. Just citing you, moment, not to speak about a feminist art movement, but rather about a women's art experiment that searches for self-expression and visual articulation from a woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. I will respond to the first question. I'm busy trying to shift a uh, uh, screen on gallery view. I didn't make it, so I only can see uh, Christina. I want to see everyone face to face here. I didn't make it here. So uh, response to the first question. That's not going to be a easy or quick response to that question because very controversial, very critical. Uh, in my career of presentations everywhere, academic setting, I can be challenged uh, constantly. How could you say uh, women's art? You know, why women's art, feminist art? Where where, where is the line? Where, where are the lines there? How could you label, you know, uh, identify this as women's art that, you know, how about the men's art, women's art, you know, very, very critical including women artists themselves. If you work in this field, you kind of interview, doing research with women artists in China, say, well, your work is a very, very strong, powerful feminist art. They would say, no, I'm not a feminist artist at all. I'm an artist. So the reason, <clears throat> again, um, I cannot respond to just one, uh, one response. First is a social political history. The Chinese feminism, you can add quite a number of adjectives in front ahead of a feminism. We have a state feminism. Uh, we have a Western theoretical feminism. We have a personal practice of feminism. Uh, we have a Chinese feminism. So there's a book titled Chinese Feminism in Plural. The whole book is talking about Chinese feminism has to be in plural. So the reason China does, have, does not have a, a social political history like Europe, French, and the United States, right? So feminist originated, its origin is a woman's voice, it's a woman's right. It is feminist from the very beginning, it's social political uh, movements, and it has a long, long, long history originated from women themselves. But in China, no, from ancient history to modern history, to socialist history, to commercial history, no, there's no individual political movement labeled as Chinese feminism. It's a hijacked by historical moments. Like uh, uh, in the imperial time, you know, women and genders kind of read and interpreted in the traditional terms. And the socialist China is a socialist feminism. They have a women's association, that's a government organization. No, 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 your feminism. We have a state, official feminism. Let me, you know, let us speak for you. That's feminism. And now, like in contemporary art market here, it's very often, where are women? Where are women artworks? They are so wonderful. Look at the wit witness here. But uh, they cannot speak for themselves because the market, expression space, and everything pretty much contemporary avant-garde male artists dominated here, you know, except for our exhibition here, but few will just organize our exhibition by this. So for women themselves, not now I'm talking, I'm addressing social political context and understand why there's no really uh, 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 feminism here and why artists uh, speak against that. If he, woman artists in China, if you label yourself, I am a woman artist, I am a feminist artist, you out yourself, out the canon, which means you're not good enough. You don't have a very powerful works. Then you borrow a political label to label yourself. I'm powerful because of feminism. They want to say, I'm an artist. 
as good as 刘晓东 as good as anyone else. I'm an artist first. I'm a human first. Don't label me as a feminist. That's second class. That's why they really don't like this label. So when I talked. I have a two kinds of language here. When I talk to the Western theoretical academic setting, I would talk about the feminists and feminism all the time. When I talk to women artists in China, I'm very, very careful. Can I you know, define your work as a feminist art? So they say, yes, you can in your own writing, but don't uh, talk you know, use me citation as a feminist art. The last one, Jiang Jie, she won't say this is a feminist art in public, but in her own personal writing, she said, this is one of my best, best powerful work in my career because so feminist. I turned the phallic power into impotent and dying. So they are feminists, but they don't, they don't like the label. So my response may be they do feminist practice all the time and are very, very powerful. They just don't like the label. Another, add one more note, feminist, Feminist theory is introduced from our language. I mean, the Western theory. When the language trans are uh, translated into, it's very different because outside the context. So we cannot apply in you know, a feminist like a British and French in United States. Uh, this is our feminist and that's a notion, the concept. Hey, let's apply this. No, very, very, very careful. You're talking about the Western feminist in your own context rather than Chinese context. So that's another reason. Translingual. We're talking about the translingual politics too. Thank you. Um, your explanations help a lot to understand a bit more. So I would like to open our round for questions to our guests. So please, um, if you have comments or questions, please feel free to open your microphone. Not at the moment. So um, I will I will ask another question or um, uh, observation um, I had or I always have when I'm going through our exhibition, stepping out. So um, what what imp what is impressing me very much is that. Um, most of the works in our exhibition um, are about biographies, about stories, uh, biographies and stories about women. It can be autobiographical, um, like the paintings by uh, Yu Hong, for example, very beautiful with opening these two paintings, I think in 1994 with a third one for her daughter. Yes, in the bottom, Yu Hong. Or uh, I, I really love He Cheng Yao and how he is using her body and her nudity um, to heal the pain of her mother. So this is a story about uh, the painful past of the mother are very touching when Hui with the third grandmother or um, wider with uh, stories of, um, um, about anonymous women, Tao Amin, or Peng Wei who is going back in history and picking out biographies by, by ancient women, yes. So um, I was not sure Zhu uh, Jin, maybe you can tell me, um, was that now um, uh, incident that we just gathered a lot of pieces um, and artists and their artworks who are dealing with stories and biographies, or is this something uh, with what Chinese female artists are working a lot? I really don't want to confine that way because you raised the question. You know, women artists in China, they only care about themselves or self identity or self portraitures. No, there are all kinds of practices here. Uh, there too. 
Again, I don't want to confine them or make them into restrictions here, but happen to be the selections here because I want to support the four arguments there, you know, gender and history, and then everything through female body, you know, that's the focus here. Actually, uh, women art practice in China is not just self, not just identity, can be history, can be revolution, and it can, can be public and everything. Uh, the reason that why uh, here we see the focus of the body and the self and the identity and the pain, everything, I'm thinking because the title is a woman's art, right? So the departure point of a woman's art is kind of a me, myself, and my body. I take that as a, a point of departure. And the body and the self and the identity is not only political or individual or body issue, it's kind of a both. One on the one hand is a thematic or social political or gender politics. On the other is a medium. Uh, pretty much many you know, practices here use their own body as the medium here. So the medium is the canva, is the fill, kind of projection and a written canvas that they can make that self and identity possible and the visible. But they do in a very smart way you know, everybody practice totally uh, different. For instance, Yu Hong. How about the Yu Hong? The reason at the very beginning I said I don't want to confine them into just self and identity in the body. How about Yu, Yu Hong? I said her uh, self, uh, like a uh, the whole sequential starting in 1999 and going on this year because I'm very close to her when she was in uh, New York and and. I know her. I said, what's your recent self-portraiture? Still same form, you know, collage of herself and everything. And then very often on the one side is herself, you know, like a last year, a couple of years ago, COVID-19 in New York City, everything. And again, another image is the social public or something there. So they really care about the social, political, public domain issues, but body, maybe body personal, uh, it's kind of a point of departure there. Again, uh, the practice is very, very different. I can cite many examples there, like uh, one person really cares about urbanization, Xin Danwen. Another one, Xu Xiaoyan, cares about the environmental issues. You don't see anybody or women and the self or self literature at all, not at all, which means whatever human artists you care about and they care about too, it just happened to be, you know, my focus is gender. Without the gender, if you assign me the topic of environmental art, totally different. Uh, art of COVID-19 can be very, very different. And art of politics can be very different. However, I want to make an argument, even if it's art pieces, nothing about a woman or gender or whatever, but about the history politics, you will see female artistic aesthetics. You will see it. I will see from perspective. I will see the aesthetic approaching. I will see the style. I will see the color, whatever. There is something feminine or gendering or even feminist if the topic is totally different. Good, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, I would ask I would, last... I would have one question. Um, I was I was reading a lot, um, or not a lot, but a little bit. Uh, Gayatri Spivak, and uh, she she wrote a lot about the subaltern, the female subaltern. And I was wondering if putting this this uh, label of of feminism to 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 art um, is a little bit uh, difficult in some way because it is making it um, how to explain how to say it. It is making it easier to understand, or you have this label and you think you understand it, but you don't. And I know that the Salzburg Museum had, for example, as well, an exhibition by Uli Sieg. Um, the, the I didn't see the exhibition, but I have the catalog. And he wrote, for example, that what is interesting is that the new aspects of art are not that much seen because it is kind of 
I mean, it is a different historiography and it is a totally different, I mean, with the Cultural Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was just thinking that maybe if, if we put on the label, it's a Western label and it's something we don't see then the new and the, the, the we just see services, specific aspects about the art. So that was. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to see you in person. <laughs> I shifted uh, the, the view here, and thank you very much uh, for that question. It's kind of a follow up question, right? We, we, uh, Christina and me, we talked about that question, the label. I totally agree. I'm a very, very careful. I'm a very, very cautious to label whatever I'm talking about or writing about. Use the feminist arts. You know, I use even women's, even women's art is problematic. And the feminists are even more controversial and problematic too. Like you, you, you are concerned about this. Yes, feminist, who's feminist or feminist? Who's feminist, right? Could be the Western feminist, can be a Chinese official feminist, you know, can be, you know, totally, you know, depends on the uh, label and the concept here. So the, I would say controversial, problematic. If you want to use feminist, you have to locate that into theoretical and the historical and the cultural context, rather than it's going to be shaky. That's one. And the second, I respond to your question. Yes, the uh, sections here, very much talking about that generation or early works of women's art, right, in contemporary China. And I only have one or two younger uh, women artists here. I'm sure that Christina will uh, provide more because the whole collection and the catalog of uh, Stepping Out is focused on younger generation. So for the younger generation, yes, I have to go, yes, for younger generation, they don't care. They even don't know what the Cultural Revolution means to them, right? So they don't care that so much of, you know, what is Cultural Revolution? What is Mao? You know, whatever, like a uh, Xing uh, Diamonds. They even don't know what's what's that? Why pride in the body and collage with the mouse portrait? You know, it's not their interest, whatever. So I really love your idea. That's the topic is open for research for exhibition, depending upon your topic. When you do a new topic research, again, if no feminist, that's fine. But if you want to apply feminist, do a historical, theoretical, conceptual, and the cultural context, really, because really, really controversial and problematic. You will be challenged by both sides, because I, I did. You know, Western theorists will challenge me. You know, you are using the Western theorists here and are talking about the Chinese film arts. When I go to China, they will challenge me. Hey, I'm not a feminist, don't use that term. So anyone in this position will be challenged. Hope I, I elaborated the, the question. That's my response. I'll be very careful with this topic and subjects. Well, fine. So what would you say, Shu Jin, um, where is the art by Chinese female artists heading to? So what is the perspective for, for the future? What would you say? That's a very good question too. I feel I'm not very strong to say something very, very specific, maybe even exhibition and curators like you even know better. Because after publication of my uh, Gender the Bodies, the whole book and a special collection of uh, what? Uh, the, the, the special collection mm -hmm. and a number of articles because I follow the Jiang Jie, that's my recent research. I did not follow very closely with the young, 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 very younger generation. And I do browse their works, but not research. You know, research and browsing their works, totally different. And I see they are fantastic uh, artworks, very, very different from, from anything my approach were familiar, I did before. I would say multiple, diverse, multiple and totally different interests in the focus. Not that cultural revolution motivated, not very much political uh, motivated, but I still feel self there. Like Liu Xi, you know, like younger, younger ones, you know, everything in the album of a stepping out, self is there, female body is there. And uh, 
uh, kind of a female approach, especially point of views are there. Again, not only younger generation, that's not fair. Like uh, Yu Hong, I said, Yu Hong, Yu Hong is a master artist of oil painting. Now she does something like a uh, uh, Wen Hui, like a uh, uh, collage, the uh, oil painting and uh, video work. And uh, even kind of kind of a second space or virtual space or something. So both older generation, the younger generation, they try everything. There's no single term we can define. Oh, this is a woman's art in China. No, that's going to be unfair to artists. They're so diverse, so different, so vibrant. But the only problem I end my presentation already, pending upon who is talking about them who is writing about them, who has the space to show their works. Otherwise, they remain you know, marginalized. They remain uh, invisible. That's the duty. I'm not a trained you know, visual artist or something. I'm a film person. It's because invisible, as I have to do some research. I have to uh, curate a uh, uh, exhibition. I have to something because their works are so beautiful, so powerful. I feel very positive, very confident that the beautiful works that they are making daily. We only see a few here. For me, go to China. Anyone who wants to make a research about the topic, not only go to exhibitions, go to China, stay there and be friends with women artists. You will, you will, we will change our mind and you will produce a book very quickly because of their works. They're so powerful, beautiful. Diverse. Diverse, okay. So uh, thank you, Shujin. We have to come to an end. And I would like to give you a um, bit information about coming events. So if you would like to hear more from our experts from the advisory board, there will be another two coming up. Um, there will be on June 6th. Um, there will be an expert talk with Louisa Guest, our expert from Australia. She will be here in Salzburg at the time. And she will. She is going to, to visit the exhibition. And the title of her um, talk will be Understanding Gendered Materiality and Motherhood in Contemporary Chinese Art. And she will be in conversation with our co-curator and artist Liu Shi. That Wonderful. will be that will be on June 6. And uh, another talk will be with uh, Monica Merlin. I don't know if you know that she uh, she organized a really huge uh, interview archive at the Tate. Uh, with um, Chinese uh, female artists that never ex that did not exist before. So she did a fundamental work here. And she is uh, talking about understanding Chinese women's art history. So um, again, with an artist from the exhibition. So if you want to uh, get to know more, if you're interested to hear more from our experts, please join our uh, meetings. Monica Merlins will be one day after Louise's talk. Um, Monica's will be on Wednesday, June 7th. So um, all I have to do now is to thank you, the audience, and uh, especially to thank um, Shu Jin, uh, not only for for the for your contribution today, for your lecture, for your insights, for your thoughts, but in general, for all your support in connection with this project, as I said before, it wouldn't have been possible without you to realize it. It was really, really important for us. Thank you so much for this opportunity, truly, yeah.